Hi, hello, come along. Tonight we're starting a new playlist, a new book. Are you ready? Before we start that though, if I just remind you, tantalise you a little bit with the books that are coming up in the future. I'll only do this once and then in the future you'll know what's coming, won't you? So I've got a bit of a pile going on, look, <laughs> requests. So um, one of those requests was, of course, blimey, after this one, well, um, there's another of the series as well we can do. There's more as well, but this is the next one. So this will come up in the near future. I Shall Wear Midnight by Terry Pratchett. Um, also, in the near future, we are going to have The Phantom Tollbooth by Norton Juster. I've never, 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 never read this one before. So that'll be a new experience for me. Uh, the last book that we did was... Um, by Diana Wynne Jones. I'd never read any of hers either, and I really enjoyed them. So hopefully, this will be another good recommendation. Of course, it's going to be a good recommendation. You guys recommended it, so that's going to be on an upcoming set of reading as well. I don't know what to call it. Set of reading playlist. I think is the best thing to call it on YouTube, isn't it? This is another one that's coming up. Again, never read this one, but I have it on good authority that this one a bad spelling yet looks very good the guy on the front i know you should never book book a judge by its cover <laughs> but um the guy on the front looks a little bit discworld fans like rinse wind doesn't he and by reading the the blurb on the back it does smack of rinse wind as well i don't know when this was written uh 1991 so yeah so maybe inspired by Rincewind. That'll be interesting to find out, won't it? So we've got this one coming up as well. E. Dale Britton. That's who wrote this. A bad spelling yet. And then um, also on the on the play, on the to-do list, to-do list is this one as well. Another Keys to the Kingdom book. We've just earlier on uh, in this year, we had Mr. Monday. Next up is Grim Tuesday by Garth Nix. See how old uh, Arthur is getting on in there, can't we? All right, so they're all to come. But we're starting the next one tonight. And of course, before I forget, Valentine's Day edition. <gasps> uh, roses are red. Violets are blue. Tonight we'll start a book that is new. And that's all of the Valentines that we'll do. So um, tonight we start this one, don't we? Terry Pratchett's Wintersmith, another book, book three of the Tiffany Aiken series. Now, I've just been, if you've been following, I've just been reading those two Diana Wynne Jones books. And the last one was set in Caprona, the Magicians of Caprona. And I had a lot of Italian accent to do in that one. I've now got a switch back from Italian to Scottish to make sure that we can get some of our little wee free men in there. Are there any on the front cover? Hang on, let me have a closer look. There are no wee free men on the cover, but I bet that somewhere in that room with Tiffany, and I presume Granny Weatherwax this is meant to be, I guess that there is a Knack-Mack Fiegel hiding in there somewhere. They're always about, aren't they? But anyway, look, three minutes and 43 seconds, good grief. Whew. Let's make a start, shall we? Here we go. Terry Pratchett's Wintersmith. When the storm came, it hit the hills like a hammer. No sky should hold as much snow as this, and because no sky could, it fell. Fell in a wall of white. There was a small hill of snow where there had been a few hours ago a little cluster of thorn trees on an ancient mound. This time last year, there had been a few early primroses. Now there was just snow. Part of the snow moved. A piece about the size of an apple rose up with smoke pouring out around it. A hand, no larger than a rabbit's paw, waved the smoke away. A very small but very angry blue face with a lump of snow still balanced on top of it looked out at the sudden white wilderness. Ah, Cravens! It grumbled. Will you not look at this? Ah, oh, tis the work of the wintersmith. Nay, there's a scunner that will nae take no for an answer. Other lumps of snow were pushed up. More heads peered out. Oh, waley, 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 said one of them. He's found the big wee hag again. 
the first head turned towards this head and said, Daft woolly. Yes, Rob. Did I not tell ye to lay off all of that whaley business? I, Rob, ye did that, said the head addressed as Daft Woolly. So tell me, why did ye just do it? Sorry, Rob, it, it kind of bursted out. It's so dispiriting. Sorry, Rob. Rob, anybody sighed. But I fear ye are right, Woolly. He's come for a big wee hag right enough. He's watching over her down at the farm right now. Uh, wee dangerous spike, Rob. Rob looked up at the clouds so full of snow that they sagged in the middle. Okay, he said, and he sighed again. It's time for the hero. He ducked out of sight, the plug of snow dropping neatly back into place and slid down into the heart of the fegal mound. It was quite big inside. A human could just about stand up in the middle, but they would then bend double with coffin because the middle was where there was a hole to let the smoke out. All around the inner wall were tiers of galleries and every one of them was packed with fegals. Usually the place was awash with noise, but now it was frighteningly quiet. Rob anybody walked across the floor to the fire where his wife Jeannie was waiting. She stood up straight and proud like a kelder should, but close up it seemed to him that she'd been crying. He put his arm around her. All right, you probably ken what's happening, he told the blue and red audience looking down on him. This is near common storm. The wintersmith has found the big wee hag. Now then, settle down. <laughs> he waited until the shouting and sword rattling had died down. Then he went on. We canny fight the wintersmith for her. That's her road. We canny work it for her. But the hag of hags has sent us on another path. It's a dark one and it's dangerous. A cheer went up. Fiegel's liked the idea of this at least. Right, said Rob, satisfied this, with this. I'm away to fetch the hero. There was a lot of laughter at this, and Big Yan, the tallest of the feagles, shouted, That's too soon. We've only had time to give him a couple of hero lessons. He's still no more than a big streak of nothing. He'll be a hero for a big wee hag, and that's the end of it, said Rob sharply. Nay, off you go, the whole boiling are you, to the chalk pit. Dig me a path to the underworld. It had to be the wintersmith, Tiffany Aiken told herself, standing in front of her father in the freezing farmhouse. She could feel it out there. This wasn't normal weather, even for midwinter, and this was springtime. It was a challenge. Or perhaps it was just a game. It was always hard to tell with the wintersmith. Only it can't be a game because the lambs are dying. I'm only just 13 and my father and a lot of other people older than me want me to do something and I can't. The wintersmith has found me again. He's here now and I'm too weak. It would be easier if they were bullying me but no, they're begging me. My father's face is grey with worry and he's begging. My father is begging me. Oh no, he's taking his hat off. He's taking off his hat to speak to me. They think magic comes free when I snap my fingers. But if I can't do this for them now, what good am I? I can't let them see that I'm afraid. Witches aren't allowed to be afraid. And this is my fault. I, I started all this. I have to finish it. Mr. Aiken cleared his throat. And um, if you could, uh, if you could magic it all away uh, or something for us. Everything in the room was grey because the light from the windows was coming through snow. No one had wasted time digging the horrible stuff away from the houses. Every person who could hold a shovel was needed elsewhere, and still there were not enough of them. As it was, most people had been up all night, walking the flocks of yearlings, trying to keep the new lamb safe in the dark, in the snow. Her snow. It was a message to her, a challenge, a summons. All right. She said, I'll see what I can do. Uh, good girl, said her father, grinning with the relief. No, not a good girl, thought Tiffany. I brought this on us. You will have to make a big fire up by the sheds, she said aloud. I mean a big fire. Do you understand me? Make it out of anything that will burn and you must keep it going. I'll. It'll keep trying to go out, but you must keep the fire 
going. Keep piling on the fuel, whatever happens. The fire must not go out. She made sure that the knot was loud and frightening. She didn't want people's minds to wander. She put on the heavy brown woolen cloak that Miss Treason had made for her and grabbed the black pointy hat that hung on the back of the farmhouse door. There was a sort of communal grunt from the people who'd crowded into the kitchen, and some of them backed away. We want a witch now. We need a witch now, but we'll back away now too. That was the magic of the pointy hat. It was what Miss Treason called boffo. Tiffany Aiken stepped out into the narrow corridor that had been cut through the snow-filled farmyards where the drifts were more than twice the height of a man. At least the deep snow kept off the worst of the wind which was made of knives. A track had been cleared all the way down to the paddock but it had been heavy going. When there is 15 feet of snow everywhere how are you going to clear it? Where can you clear it to? She waited by the cart sheds whilst the men hacked and scraped at the snowbanks. They were tired to the soul by now. They'd been digging for hours. The important thing was, but there were a lot of important things. It was important to look calm and confident. It was important to keep your mind clear. It was important not to show how pants-wettingly scared you were. She held out a hand, caught a snowflake and took a good look at it wasn't one of the normal ones. Oh no, it was one of his special snowflakes. That was nasty. He was now taunting her. Now she could hate him. She'd never hated him before, but he was killing the lambs. She shivered and pulled the cloak around her. This I choose to do, she croaked, her breath leaving little clouds in the air. She cleared her throat and started again. This I choose to do. If there is a price, this I choose to pay. If it is my death, then I choose to die. Where this takes me, there I choose to go. I choose. This I choose to do. It wasn't a spell except in her own head, but if you couldn't make spells work in your own head, you couldn't make them work at all. Tiffany wrapped her cloak around her against the clawing wind and watched dully as the men brought straw and wood. The fire started slowly, as if frightened to show enthusiasm. She'd done this before, hadn't she? Dozens of times. The trick was not that hard when you got the feel of it, but she'd done it with the time to get her mind right, and anyway, she'd never done it with anything more than a kitchen fire to warm her freezing feet. In theory, it should be just as easy with a big fire and a field of snow, right? Right? The fire began to roar up. Her father put his hand on her shoulder. Tiffany jumped. She'd forgotten how quietly he could move. What was that about choosing? He said. She'd forgotten what good hearing he had too. It's, um, it's a witch thing, she answered, trying not to look at his face. So if this doesn't work, it's no one's fault but mine, all right? This is my fault, she added to herself. It's unfair, but no one said it wasn't going to be. Her father's hand caught her chin and gently turned her head around. How soft his hands are, Tiffany thought. Big man's hands, but soft as a baby's because of the grease on the sheep's fleeces. We shouldn't have asked you, should we? He said. Yes, you should have asked me, Tiffany thought. The lambs are dying under this dreadful snow, and I should have said no. I should have said I'm not that good yet. But the lambs are dying under the dreadful snow. There will be other lambs, said her second thoughts. But those aren't lambs, are they? These are the lambs that are dying here and now, and they're dying because I listened to my feet and I dared to dance with the winter smith. I can do it, she said. Her father held her chin and stared into her eyes. Are you sure, Jigget? he said. It was a nickname her grandmother had given to her, Granny Aiken, who never lost a lamb to dreadful snow. He'd never used it before. Why had it risen up in his mind now? Yes! She pushed his hand away and broke his gaze before she burst into tears. I haven't oh I I haven't told your mother this yet, said her father very slowly, as if the words required enormous care. But I can't find your brother. I think you were trying to help. Abe Swindle said he saw him with his little shovel. Um, I'm sure he's all right, but keep an eye open for him, yeah? He's got his red coat on. His face, with no expression at all, was heartbreaking to see. Little Wentworth, nearly seven years old, always running after the men, always wanting to be one of them, always trying to help. How easily a small body could get overlooked. 
The snow was still coming fast. The horribly wrong snowflakes were white on her father's shoulders. It's these little things you remember when the bottom falls out of the world and you're falling. That wasn't just unfair. That was cruel. Remember the hat you wear. wear, wear. Remember the job that is in front of you. Balance. Balance of the thing. Hold balance in the centre. Hold the balance. Tiffany extended her numb hands to the fire to draw out the warmth. Remember, don't let the fire go out, she said. I got men bringing up wood from all over, said her father. I told them to bring all coal from the forge too. It won't run out of feeding, I promise you. The flame danced and curved towards Tiffany's hands. The trick was, the trick, the trick was to fold the heat somewhere close, draw it with you and balance, forget everything else. I'll come with, her father began. No, you watch the fire, Tiffany shouted too loudly, frantic with fear. You will do what I say. I am not your daughter today, her mind screamed. I am your witch. I will protect you. She turned before she could see before he could see her face and ran through the flakes along the track that had been cut towards the lower paddocks. The snow had been trodden down into a lumpy, hummocky path made slippery with fresh snow. Exhausted men with shovels pressed themselves into the snowbanks on either side rather than get in her way. She reached the wider area where other shepherds were digging into the wall of snow. It tumbled in lumps around them. Stop! Get back! Her voice shouted whilst her mind wept. The men obeyed quickly. The mouth that had given the, that order had a pointy hat over it. You did not argue with that. Remember the heat. The heat. Remember the heat. Balance. Balance. This was witching cut to the bones. No toys, no wands, no buffo, no, headolo no headology, no tricks. All that mattered was how good you were. But sometimes you had to trick yourself. She wasn't the summer lady and she wasn't Granny Weatherwax. She needed to give herself all the help she could get. She pulled the little silver horse out of her pocket. It was greasy and stained and she'd meant to clean it, but there'd been no time, no time. Like a knight putting on his helmet, she fastened the silver chain around her neck. She should have practised more. She should have listened to people. She should have listened to herself. She took a deep breath and held out her hands on either side of her, palms up. On her right hand, a white scar glowed. Thunder on my white hand, she said. Lightning in my left hand. Fire behind me, frost in front of me. She stepped forward until she was only a few inches away from the snowbank. She could feel its coldness already pulling the heat out of her. Well, so be it. She took a few deep breaths. This is what I choose to do. Frost to fire, she whispered. In the yard, the fire went white and roared like a furnace. The snow wall spluttered and then exploded into steam, sending chunks of snow into the air. Tiffany walked forward slowly. Snow pulled back from her hands like a mist at sunrise. It melted in the heat of her, becoming a tunnel in a deep drift, fleeing with her, writhing around her in clouds of cold fog. Yes, she smiled desperately. It was true. If you had the perfect centre, if you got your mind right, you could balance. In the middle of the seesaw is a place that never moves. Her boots squelched over warm water. There was fresh green grass under the snow because the awful storm had been so late in the year. They walked on, head into where the lamin pens were buried. Her father stared at the fire. It was burning white hot like a furnace, eating through the wood as if driven by a gale. It was collapsing into ashes in front of her eyes. Water was pouring around Tiffany's boots. Yes, but don't think about it. Hold the balance. More heat. Frost to fire. There was a bleat. <clears throat> Sheep could live under snow, at least for a little while. But as Granny Aching used to say, when the gods made sheep, they must have left their brains in their other coat. In a panic, and sheep were always just an inch from panic, they'd trample their own lambs. Now, now ewes and lambs appeared, steaming and bewildered as the snow melted around them as if they were sculptures left behind. Tiffany moved on, staring straight ahead of her, only just aware of the excited cries of the men behind her. They were following her, pulling the ewes free, cradling the yams, lambs. Her father yelled at the other men. Some of them were hacking at a farm cart, throwing the wood down into the white hot flames. Others were dragging furniture up from the house. Wheels, tables, straw bales, chairs. The fire took everything, gulped it down and roared for more. And there wasn't any more. 
No red coat. No red coat. Balance. Balance. Tiffany waded on, water and sheep pouring past her. The tunnel ceiling fell, fell in a splashing and slithering of slush. She ignored it. Fresh snowflakes fell down through the hole and boiled in the air above her head. She ignored that too. And then ahead of her, a glimpse of red. Frost to fire. The snow fled and there he was. She picked him up, held him close, sent some of her heat into him, felt him stare and she whispered, it weighed at least 40 pounds, at f least 40 pounds. She, he coughed and opened his eyes. Tears falling like melting snow, she ran over to a shepherd and thrust the boy into his arms. Take him to his mother and do it now. The man grabbed the boy and ran, frightened of her fierceness. Today she was their witch. Tiffany turned back. There were more lambs to be saved. Her father's coat landed in the starving flames, glowed, glowed for a moment, then fell into grey ashes. The other men were ready. They grabbed the man as he went to jump after it and pulled him back, kicking and shouting. The flint cobbles had melted like butter. They spluttered for a moment, then froze. The fire went out. Tiffany Aiken looked up into the eyes of the winter smith and up on the roof of the cart shed the small voice belonging to wee dangerous spikes said, Ah, Crivens! All of this hasn't happened yet. It might not happen at all. The feature's always a bit wobbly. Any little thing, like the fall of a snowflake or the dropping of the wrong kind of spoon, can send it spinning off along a new path. Or perhaps not. Where it all began was last autumn, on the day with a cat in it. Next chapter... Miss Treason. We'll get there tomorrow night. Whoa. Hardcore Tiffany. She's being the witch that she needs to be. I love it. Okay. Come back tomorrow night for chapter two.